Welcome to Legacy. So good to have you here. My name's Gary. If I've not met you, lead pastor here at Legacy. Thank you for joining us. Kind of a brisk Sunday. Kind of a, bri- a little brisk out there. I, I looked out the window early this morning over a cup of coffee. And I said to Patty, oh, it's going to be a gorgeous day. Look at that. And we said, Alexa, I won't say it loud because your watches will probably go nuts. Alexa, what's the temperature today or whatever? Uh, snow showers, whatever. Okay. So, <laughs> snow showers. Yeah. Spring is on its way, folks. Spring is on its way. So we're looking forward to that. We're in a series Upside Down Kingdom, and we've got some ground to cover together this morning. We're going to be receiving communion uh, at the end of the gathering, so hopefully you have uh, a, uh, some communion uh, with you, the juice and the, the cup with you, and we'll uh, be receiving that and have opportunity to grab more of those at the end. The book of Mark, uh, it's a fast-paced book. And in fact, if you're taking notes today, I hope you are. Uh, the, the, the message title today is The Most Important Yes. The Most Important Yes. Uh, fast-paced pay, paced book, fast action, Jesus is on the move. Mark, again, is most likely the first of the Gospels that is written. Uh, the, the first generation of eyewitnesses and apostles are sort of dying off and And up to this point, the message had been spread verbally, orally, uh, and now it was was time to capture it and write it down and and, and get this for generations, for the generations following, so that that the the, the, the picture uh, and the person of Jesus could be communicated clearly, so that if you had any questions on the writing of Mark or any of the gospel writers for that matter, you could still find people that were alive who knew him and verify, is this true? Did you see this? And they would say, absolutely, yes. Or if there was a variation or somebody was trying to concoct some sort of different version of Jesus, they could at that point tell you and clarify and correct. And so that's good to know. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the key, the hinge passage to the book of Mark Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says it this way. For even the son of man, Jesus is saying, uh, speaking, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Watch this, keep that slide up there for a minute. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Came not to be served, but to serve. Give his life a ransom for many. Uh, The message paraphrase captures this part here. Give his life as a ransom for many this way came to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. I mean, that's important to capture that. He he came to give his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. This passage informs us that he came not to be served, but to serve. So it it shows us he came as as a servant to give his life away in exchange for, as a ransom for many who are being held hostage. So we could could literally say, if it's important to Jesus, then it ought to be important to us. If it's important to Jesus, it it really sets the template and the tone for the book that that Mark is, we're we're about to read and we're we're kind of perusing through together. I, I like to say it this way. And, and capture this. If you watch what Jesus does, you watch what Jesus does so you can do what Jesus did. I don't know if that's grammatically correct, but in my Los Angeles educated mind, <laughs> it made sense. Watch what Jesus does, so as you're reading the text, so that you can do what Jesus did. You'll better understand then why he treated the demoniac the way he did with the authority that he took over and, and the leprous man, how he, why he treated him with such tenderness and, and breaking cultural and ceremonial barriers to touch the man and, and said, I'm willing to make you clean and, and, and to, 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 to minister to the sick of people with grace and to reach the lost with zeal. Why? Because, because they're why he came. They're why he came. So I watch what Jesus does. Then I learn when I do that how to do what Jesus did. And Mark gives us a window to see 
how Jesus begins. We're just sort of setting, setting the, the table here for a moment. Mark gives us a window to how Jesus began, sort of the purpose statement. Like, I, you get this a lot. People need to know the why. You gotta give them the why, right? We, 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 we understand that. Here's the why. And Mark's given us the why, a kind of a summary to summarize Jesus' ministry. And, and he says it this way, Mark 1, 14 and 15. This is after John the Baptist is arrested because he called out the king on uh, some indiscretions, we'll say. Verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There it is. That's the why. Repent and believe in the God. The time's come. The kingdom of God is at, is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Those sort of symbiotic words. Repent and believe. Repenting towards something. Repenting toward a belief in Jesus. In the gospel. The gospel. The euangelion. The Greek word euangelion. The gospel. The, the good news. By the way, that word gospel. How many of you know that's not a Christian word? I, I don't think I always knew that. I, that's just a, that's a Christian word. It's not a Christian word. In fact, the ancient Rome, there was an ancient Roman inscription that, that actually said these words, the beginning of the gospel of Caesar Augustus, his birth and coronation. The, that gospel meant in those days an event with history-making life. It was history-making, life-shaping news. So the gospel of Caesar Augustus, it usually had to do with something, a big event, a coronation or a, an ascension to the throne or a, or a victory in battle. There was a, it was the, the gospel, it was, it was being told. So you bring that word, Mark brings that word over to Jesus, come on. He brings that word over to Jesus and it's a game changer. It's something that has been done in history, something that has been done for you that changes your status and my status forever. This is what has been accomplished for you. Jesus lived and died for you that you may be saved. This is the euangelion. This is the gospel. It's good news. It's good news. God accepts you. Where God accepts you, good news, gospel, where God accepts you, not on the basis of your past, but on the basis of Christ's past. Anybody glad about that? I'm glad it ain't based on your past. I'm glad about that, right? But it's based on his past, based on what he did, not based on what you have done or performed, but on the basis of what he has done for you and for me. This is good news. This is what compelled Jesus to come. This was the news that he came to deliver. And it's the message that needs to continue to be spread to the four corners of the, of the globe. Watch what Jesus does so you can do what Jesus did. Would you just say that out loud with me? I think that's worth repeating together. Come on, let's say it. Watch what Jesus does so you can do what Jesus did. Which begs the question then, how, does he, how do we share this message? How do we do this? What was Jesus' plan to spread the, the message? What's the plan to spread the good news? And I'd like to just say it this way today. Jesus put a team together. He did. Like he put a team together. He went after a team. What was Jesus' plan to spread? He assembled a team. And, it, and it, so then it begs the next question, what makes us think we can do this alone? I mean, if Jesus needed a team of guys around him and people or followers with him, what makes us think, we go, oh, I, I just do it alone. I'm just kind of an introvert. I don't need people. Really? What if you had a team? What would that look like? What if you had support around you? What if you had people that actually believed in you and looked at you and said you're willing to walk alongside of you and with you and were for you and encouraged you like on a week-to-week -week basis? What, imagine, imagine that. That's a team. So I want to look at today how Jesus assembles his team. 
the call, we'll call it the call of the first disciples, the call of the first apostles. And here's the narrative in Mark chapter 1, verse 16. It says it this way. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, and this would be Simon Peter, uh, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee. Zebedee. And John, just worth saying again. And John, his brother, who, uh, who were in their boat mending the nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. This next slide is a picture of the Sea of Galilee, a sunrise. We got to enjoy that sunrise over the Sea of Galilee. A little blurry, a little pixelated, but maybe from your perspective, just let's leave it there just for a peaceful moment as you're thinking about the disciples being called. It was along that pretty cool experience walking along that shoreline where these disciples were, were called. Two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew, and then James and John. And the others are called later, Levi, uh, Matthew, at least the, the, the Mark account. Levi's calling happens in chapter 2, and the other seven uh, are called in the third chapter. But we're going to just deal with the, these first four. Uh, because really it sets the tone for the way Jesus called all of the disciples. We see it clearly here in the way that he called these first four. Uh, one commentator had a kind of a humorous take on this, which I liked. He said, the order of how, we, how the, the, the disciples were picked is really not primary. It's not a primary focus. He says, rather the emphasis is on the fact that they were even called at all. Like, these are normal dudes, right? None of them were worthy of Jesus' call. Few, if any, were of noble background, and none of them had religious clout. At least four of the disciples were fishermen. Simon was a zealot, part of a political group that sought to overthrow the Roman government. Matthew worked for the Roman govern government as a tax collector, would have been viewed essentially as a traitor to the Israelites. And Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, eventually betrayed Jesus. That's the team, folks. So I'd like to look at the, this, how uh, Jesus pulls together his disciples three ways. Write these words down, if you would. The call, the cost, and the cause. The call, the cost, and the cause. Uh, and this call is pretty... It's pretty clear. I mean, there's not much to it. Uh, so we think. And if you've been around the church and the Bible, the Gospels a long time, we read that, sort of read right through it, and we just kind of keep going. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. That was the call. Follow me. I'll make you become fishers of men. And it's interesting, because Jesus is doing the calling here in first century practices the pupils, the students, were the ones that chose the rabbis, not the other way around. Here we have Jesus choosing his students. Jesus is choosing his pupils. He's the one that's doing the calling. And he's showing us something here we, we can't miss, that the basis of relationship with Jesus is his calling us and his calling you. His calling me. It was true when he called his disciples, and guess what? It's true today. The beginning point is Jesus called me. Like you're, you might be sitting right here and having a relation, uh, having been walking a relationship with Jesus for some time or relatively short time, but it came by virtue of Jesus calling you, and you sensed it in your heart. You knew it was, and you were ready to, to follow him, right? It was, you answered the call. Maybe you're here on the front end. Maybe you're kicking the tires of a religion or church or been de church and you're kind of coming back and checking it out. And, 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 and let me just say this this way. Jesus is still calling. I got two amens. Jesus is still calling. Thank you. 
And it's a calling where you acknowledge and I acknowledge this. He's calling me. He, he, he's, calling, he's calling me. And we've all been in those awkward circumstances and situations where you're, you're kind of, maybe you're walking through a crowd. Let's just say the farmer's market. You're walking along the farmer's market and somebody's walking towards you and they're going like this. And you're looking, you're kind of, and you start responding because like they're looking right, right, looking right at you. But then you realize as you get closer, they're looking through you and by you. And you're going like this, you go, hey. <laughs> Come on, anybody done that? It's really, I mean, I've even talked to them. Hey, what's going on, man? And then you just keep walking by. That's really awkward. This is not that moment, okay? <laughs> this is not, when Jesus calls you, he's looking right at you, Cody. Look at, there's no, there's no, who me? Not, not a Gideon moment, like you gotta be, there's gotta be somebody else you're talking to. No, it's clear. He's calling you. It's clear. And based on their response, the disciples' response, the, the disciples never questioned. Again, not a, there was never a who me moment. And what's unique about Jesus' calling is it's personal. What's unique about Jesus calling is personal and no one else can answer for you. You're not called, unique about Jesus calling, you're not called in mass. Okay, if your last name ends in M, line up right here. I'm about to... Okay, this group over here, this group right over here, are you gonna fall? No, it's personal. It's your name, Roger. It's your name. It's not by family or tribe or pedigree. You're called tenderly, lovingly, individually by name, your name. And let me just say this. Names are important to Jesus, right? Read that in the Word. You see that throughout Scripture. Names are important to, to God. Your name, Mark. Your name is important to Jesus. No, that it's a Bible name. All right. <laughs> when he calls his disciples, their lives are changed. Their world is changed forever. When they're called, not only are they changed, but the, the face of the planet changes. Great things happen at the calling of the people of God the disciples of God. I've often shared my personal, how I came to Christ, and, and it, was in a, it was in a gathering like this. It was in a church service. It was coming to the front as a little boy to say yes to Jesus. But I did it several times. I was a pretty, pretty rough kid. I just kept answering, saying yes, yes, Lord. I, I, and I love hearing Patty share her story and her account about how she came to Christ. She saw it because of the radical shift in her dad's life. Her dad came home from a, a Christian concert that he was invited he was invited to. I think I heard Brittany say something about the power of invitation. And in that case, the power of invitation changed for generations to come in the O'Grady family, my wife's family. She saw her dad come home, go down to the basement, pour out all the, and it wasn't cold brew, there was another brew that was being poured down the toilet down, downstairs. And, and never turn back. And Patty, nine-year-old Patty said, if, if Jesus could do that in my daddy, then I want that. And went with the family to church and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of her life. And she's never turned back from the Lord. At Legacy Church, we have legacy kids. We have a generation of students, five and 10-year-olds, five through 10-year-olds. We'll call it the age of accountability, right? The age where kids can really understand that they're making a decision to follow Jesus. And the question to us is, and this is more of an in-house question, I get it, who among us will there be to help them understand the more, most important yes in their life? 
Who will be there? And this really is a call and a charge to parents as well. Who among us is willing to step into those environments on a Sunday and, to, and be sure that our kids have an opportunity to hear the call and to respond to the call? I mean, think, think about it. The disciples had no scope for what Jesus was calling them into, and it would change them forever when they said yes. Mom and dad, parents, grandparents, there's no greater or higher call that your children will answer than answering the call to follow Jesus. It's the most, let me say, it's the most important yes they will ever declare. And let me tell you something, there's a lot, there's a lot of voices that are gonna be calling them. We need to teach them early how to answer the most important yes. And, and I love that we have a church, our church, church environment here, Legacy Kids, is going on and they're hearing about Jesus and they're understanding how to hear his voice and to, and to worship him. We have environments, we have Legacy Kids Camp. I know 20 plus kids went to a, a kids conference uh, just a couple weeks ago and they're still talking about it. My, my, grands, my grandkids were on that trip, still talking about what Jesus did and the experience that they had. Let's teach them how to tune in to Jesus' call now. So you have to call, the call of, call of the most important call and the most important yes. Let's talk about the cost, the cost of following Jesus. We know this, it's costly. Ah, we know you're going with this, Gary. It's costly, I get it. It's intense. It's going to require something from us. No, we're not hiding it. It's not bait and switch. Oh, everything's going to be wonderful. Notice the scope, though, of the disciples' answer. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll, <laughs> and I'll, and I'll make you to become fishers of men. Look at Mark 1, 6, 1, 18. And immediately... They left their nets and followed him. That's a, that's a whole verse. Like send that as an encouragement card to somebody and, and look, birthday card, and immediately followed, immediately dropped their nets and followed him. Happy birthday. <laughs> and then going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, John, his brother, who were in the boat mending the nets, and immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. The, the, the disciples' response, Simon, Peter, and Andrew dropped their nets. Simon, Peter, and Andrew dropped their nets. James and John left their dad in the boat. Old Zeb got left behind. And in first century tradition and culture, that would have been a big deal to leave your family. That was your identity. You didn't just walk away from your family unless Jesus was calling you. Like in modern culture, it's easy. Like, ah, you gotta leave mom and dad? Hey, no big deal. But I think what the calling is, the cost of that, I think Jesus would want us to know, it's like, think of the most valuable thing. Like, I'd be willing to give up my career to follow Jesus. What's, a, what's in the modern mindset of the modern culture, what is the... What is the most important thing that we hold dear and near to us? Jesus says, I want priority over that. Your career, your business, your loves, that there's nothing in your life that's greater than your love and your devotion to me, that you couldn't remove yourself from in order to follow me. What Jesus is saying, was lean in a little more like looking like me, pleasing me, serving me, knowing me, must become the supreme passion of your life. Everything else must come second. Everything else must come second. I will never forget uh, my youth group. Thank God for a great youth ministry. We're gonna pray for Jose and pray for our youth staff. But I'll never forget standing in youth. Our, my youth pastor happened to be a songwriter and he'd write these worship songs and bring them and then just try them out on us youth, right? And one of them was, oh, I want to be like Jesus, to follow in his way, made completely in his image, more like him each day. Oh, I want to be like Jesus, 
regardless of the cost. For without the life of Jesus, I know I would be lost. What was, what was my youth pastor teaching these 15, 16, 17-year-olds? Everything else comes second. There's a cost attached to following Jesus. That the goal of following Jesus is to look more and more like him. That the longer I follow him, please get this, the more I should reflect his image. Watch what, watch what Jesus does so I can do what Jesus did. Watch what he does. We're talking about the cost of following Jesus. And again, to, modern, to the modern culture, to the modern ear, this is hard stuff to swallow. I understand that. It's what keeps, it what, it's what keeps people maybe away from church, and it's what keeps people in the church from fully engaging because it sounds, that, that sounds a little bit radical. That sounds a little bit churchy. Like that's a little too religious for me, but I think I just, I think I'm just okay kind of right here. And you know, like here is like, like here's like not following Jesus and here is radical. I just, I think God's called me, Gary, to be somewhere right in here in the middle. And I just have a hard time finding that in the Bible. Anybody with me? I just, I think if I'm just here in the middle, that's my call, that's my gift. Disciples are dropping everything to follow Jesus. But because Jesus, yeah, well, let's, let's, just, let's just push a little further. He gives stronger language in Luke's gospel. Luke 14 says, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And we all go, see, there it is, that, there. That's why I'm in the middle. That's strong language. In fact, that would be a great series, like the hard sayings of Jesus, that would be in that message. What's he saying? Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying hate your mom and dad and your family. It's not an act. He's not saying hate actively. That would be a first John violation where he says he who hates his brother likes committing murder. But he's saying hate comparatively. Comparatively speaking. I like Tim Keller's take. He says, Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me so fully, so intensely, so comprehensively, so emotionally, so supremely, so enduringly that all other attachments in your life look like hate by comparison. There's no I'll obey you ifs. No conditions on our obedience. Like Jesus, I'll obey you if my health is good and things go right and my family stays together and that relationship that I'm kind of, you know, if that could just, you know, work because the moment, you know, like the moment things go south and I'm out of here. When we say I'll follow you if, what's after that if is usually what's master. When we say I'll love you if, What's after that if is usually the thing that is driving our life. Jesus says, follow me. And it's, the call is, is personal, it's clear, and it demands an answer. There's a cost attached, everything. Jesus, I'm all in. Disciples, I'm in. And lastly, the cause. And you can even write it this way, that the cause with a promise the cause with the promise. Mark 1, 16 and 17 says it this way, passing alongside, it's the same text we've been reading, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, here it is, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men.
commentators, there are different, different takes on that translation. Like that's the most accurate of all the translations. Maybe you memorize it and I'll make you fishers of men. But the problem with that translation is we're not robots. He doesn't just turn us into disciple makers. That it's a process. He says, I'll make you to become fishers of men. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the cause? What's the purpose of this? Because everything... In t- everything today has to have a cause, right? Everything's got to have a good cause. Why are we doing that? Well, it's for a good cause. I'm going to this event, this concert, free concert, and or just donations for a good cause. A national community church, Mark Batterson's church. They have a, I forgot their name, of their, Ebenezer's is the name of their coffee shop. And it's co- they call it, like their merch says, coffee with a cause, because they give money to, to wells and, and drinking water. When we have our coffee shop in the new facility, come on, somebody say amen to that. We're going to have that. The proceeds are going to go towards a good cause. Legacies three-on-three tournament happening June 1st. Legacies three-on-three tournament happening June 1st. Come on, yeah. Uh, get ready because you're, you're going to start hearing about. In fact, if you, let me just a little commercial here. If you want to be involved in the three on three tournament, it's for a good cause. <laughs> it really is. I'll tell you that in a minute. Please take that connection card and seat back in front of you and just write three on three tournament. Call me, interested. And then put your information there so we can reach out to you. Scott and the team can reach out to you. It's, a, it's for a, why? This year, our. The cause is we're going to uh, give all the proceeds to feed our Feed One initiative through Convoy of Hope to feed hungry kids. I mean, you can't go wrong feeding hungry children. Jesus calling, what's the cause? It's to become fishers of men. That's, that's the why. Why do I want to become a fisher of men? It's, it's for the ones. Come on, Andrew, right? It's for the ones. It's for those, Jesus left the 99 and he went after the, and he went after the one. What does he want us to become fishers of men? Because he wants us to be skilled at reaching the ones, reaching lost people who don't know him, to hear about him. We're on the team. If you said, if you said yes and you answered the call, said yes to Jesus, guess what? You in. You're on the team. And the, and the goal or the cause is to become fishers of men. Those away from Christ, those without hope, apart from Christ. And here's the promise. Jesus says, I'll make you become fishers of men. That's the pro- I'll make you become. I'm going to walk. You get it. You get behind me. You watch me. Watch what Jesus does. And you, so you can do what Jesus did. I'll make you become. It's a process. It's going to take time. You're going to have to watch me closely and stay close. You're going to have, you're, you may have to walk through, most, in fact, most likely you will walk through hardship, walk through difficulty. How many of you know the way of Jesus was not an easy path? It was not easy. It was not easy sitting at the, at the table at the Last Supper, receiving that bread and that juice. Having Jesus wash their feet, it was not, that was not a comfortable environment. I would say, you know what? I think I'm going to tap out here because this is getting really difficult and dark. Or it feels that way. The disciples are frail and they're fragile and they're trying to follow Jesus. And they would be the disciples who would fall and fail and fumble forward. With all their foibles. Ah, I used to throw that out. But make no mistake, this would be the very way Jesus was going to be turning them into fishermen. Can I just pause here if you're in a difficult season right now? Can we take solace in the fact that Jesus is shaping you and he's shaping me? As difficult as it feels, as it seems, sometimes you look back in the rearview mirror and you walk through a season and you go, wow, 
I, I grew to trust Jesus more. I grew to love him more. I grew to walk with him more. That he's with you. Watch what Jesus does. You can do what Jesus did. He's committed to forming you and me and shaping us to become his disciples, even through failure, even through hardship, even through brokenness. No one, no one is exempt who would humbly say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. I think Jesus loves to go to broken places and broken people who feel like they've disqualified themselves and he still calls them by name. Come on, Tim, Bob, Jim, follow me. Watch what Jesus does so you can do what Jesus did. What's the, so what's the goal? Make you fishers of men. Found this, and I think it's worth the price of admission. In biblical imagery and Hebrew symbolism, water and the sea, like what does it mean to be a fisher of men? What does that mean? Biblical imagery and Hebrew symbolism, the water and the sea were places of chaos and of death. Darkness and coldness represented the kingdoms of the world. And you ask yourself, well, what makes the kingdom of darkness so dark? And the answer is self-centeredness, self-kingship, self-rule. Where those places where we remain offendable because of pride, because of my self-righteousness, because of my feelings of entitlement, my comforts have been violated. Self-kingship and self-centeredness and entitlement are all in the same family. And we have a culture that we're living in that is right there. Don't offend me. You do you, I'll do me. Your reality is fine for you, but don't bring your reality. Don't inter... Right? It, it's, they're just walls of pride and keyboards. <laughs> Jesus is saying, get this, this sea of darkness, this kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of darkness, is exactly where I'm sending you. I mean, Jesus had it. First century culture, he had it. Think of the religious leaders. Think of the people, the Roman culture. We don't need what you got. What it... Jesus is saying, it's here I'm going to teach you to become a fisher of men. I'll make you to be someone who knows how to draw people out of the kingdoms of darkness and into the kingdoms of light. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to draw them in. You ever meet somebody, I'm thinking of Frank right now, I'm thinking of Frank. But you just meet somebody who's just, there's just a kindness. You ever meet somebody and just, maybe they're, I got a church full of them. They're just like willing to set aside their own thing, their own agenda, their own time frame, their own, and just, and just serve you, do something for you give of their time. They're just not inconvenienced. They're going to they're gonna respond. They're going to help. They're going to give. They're going to love. They're going to serve. They're going to be there. When you're walking through tragedy, you're going to get a call from them. Are they going to show up at your door? Are they going to show up with flowers? Say, well, how, are they going to show up with a meal? Say, how, what do you need? How can I help you? How can I serve? What, what is it like? Can I, can I just tell you, if you know that, you got that person in your mind, that's a fisher of men because they've learned how to set their self-absorption aside. They've learned how to set their, their self, their pride, their, like, what, who's gonna do this for me? When's it my turn to get something? That's a fisher of men. Committed to drawing others into the light. Jesus is passing by. And he's calling. We'll close with this. And he's saying, follow me. That's the call. And there's some maybe here, you in this room, who need to answer for the first time to come to Jesus for the first time. I want to tell you, he's calling you. He's calling you by name. 
It's the most important yes you'll ever declare and give. There's some of you in here, you've stayed on the fringes for so long. You're that guy in the middle, that gal in the middle. I think, man, as long as I'm here, I'm, I think I can do this dance. And Jesus is saying, I, I, I'm calling you to a deeper place. Some of you thought you were disqualified because of sin or failure. And today he just wants that humble yes. Yes, Lord, yes, of course. He's calling you by name and the answer question is, will you say yes? The most important yes. I wanna pray for us. In fact, bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. The band's gonna come and lead us in a song. I want us to listen to the words of the song. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart wherever you are on the continuum of saying yes to Jesus, answering the most important question, follow me, will you follow me? And offering the most important yes you'll ever offer, what is it Jesus is calling you and I to? I wanna tell you something, it's not a professional pastoral call, I'm not saying that. He's not calling pastors. He is calling pastors, shaping pastors and leaders. But this is the church mobilized. This is the team. So as you listen and engage in this song, would you just determine, Jesus, what are you calling me to? Ask the question. and allow the Holy Spirit to just show you, begin to show you. Like before we, we seal what Jesus has done with communion, we need to answer what is it he's saying. So why don't we stand quietly and then, Lord Jesus, I pray even during this song, even during this song, Lord, you would speak. We release you, Holy Spirit, to speak to hearts. If it's salvation for the first time, Maybe new levels of trust, new levels of belief, new levels of service to you, new levels of giving. God, whatever it is, whatever it is. The most important yes today is always a yes to Jesus. So help us, lead us. I'm gonna come back in just a moment. Lead us in communion. Let's worship.